Jim, thank you for a fantastic overview of the whole area. Green infrastructure, new opportunities and trends. I think you covered the entire waterfront in just the short time you were up, and I appreciate it. We also appreciate uh, the, all of the work that the Environmental Law Institute has been doing. There's a room full of people here today. My name is David Pryor, by the way. I'm a partner in the public finance group at Ballard Spar. We have a room full of people who are all dedicated in one way or another to unpaving parking lots and putting up paradises in our own ways. We also have, this conference is being, because of the demand for it, this conference is being video conferenced. Uh, and we have people participating that you can see on the, uh, the television monitor over there. Uh, there are people listening from New York, Washington, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, uh, and I, I think Washington, D.C. So there's a lot of interest in this area. We appreciate the leadership of ELI. Before I introduce the, the first panel, I want to also thank ELI as being a co-sponsor of this conference, along with uh, Wendy Goldsmith uh, uh, from uh, the uh, Bioengineering uh, Group. Wendy is going to be here on the next panel. She's the founder and, and CEO of, uh, of the Bioengineering Group. So uh, it is now my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce the next topic, a uh, topic put together by a very distinguished panel, uh, led by the moderator, my partner, Bob McKinstry, who you saw earlier. And this panel uh, comes just about exactly a year from one of the biggest environmental catastrophes to ever hit the United States, at least the East Coast, Super Storm Sandy. And probably most of you in this room were affected one way or other by that uh, storm that hit uh, uh, last year at this time. The panel that Bob McKinstry has put together uh, is, is going to talk about uh, climate change. It's going to talk about uh, adaptation. It's also going to talk about sea rise and some of the things we can do to address that. Bob McKinstry is the leader of our environmental group, our sustainability initiative here at the firm. He also for a while uh, left the firm to go uh, teach at Penn State where he was a guided uh, uh, professor and chair of the uh, environmental and forestry studies at Penn State, where he did a terrific job. Bob is somebody who's committed as a national figure to the environment, and it's a pleasure for me to be able to introduce him this morning. Uh, he's a graduate, one of the first graduates uh, that had the combined uh, degree at uh, Yale for both uh, forestry and the environment. It's been a terrific uh, the last few years to have a chance to work with Bobby and our and our collaborative practice in, in financing some of these uh, projects that are so needed. So, uh, Bob, come on up and introduce your panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, David. And uh, uh, I, I find that this this next panel is particularly interesting. Come, 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 come up, please. Um, in that, uh, 12 years ago, when I started my six-year term uh, at Penn State, I joined uh, an effort that was being led by EPA at the time uh, called the originally Mid-Atlantic and then Atlantic Regional Assessment, which was looking at the impacts of, uh, of climate change. And one of the things that they found in this area was that the impacts of climate change and the impacts of, of uncontrolled development, i.e. stormwater and, and flooding, were virtually identical and uh, started to look at measures that could be taken to, uh, to mitigate those risks. And of course, um, 12 years, I guess it was 11 years later, um, uh, those, those issues uh, were dramatically um, shown to us in Superstorm Sandy. I mean, we, we all recognize that New Orleans had a problem with Katrina, but certainly people did not expect people in Staten Island to find themselves underwater and the New York subway system to be flooded. Um, uh, I, we, I'd like to introduce my panelists here. First of all, Wendy Goldsmith is the founder and CEO of the Bioengineering Group, which is a Salem, Massachusetts-based firm whose mission uh, reads Building Sustainable commun Communities on Ecological Foundation. Uh, she's really a pioneer on, in, the, in the field of ecological restoration. Um, she, actually, she headed the effort to uh, build wetlands as, uh, as a mechanism to, uh, to protect the shore of New Orleans uh, uh, post-Katrina and is applying her expertise in, um, in, in an effort which she'll discuss uh, to address the issue of, um, of, uh, of 
uh, adaptation to increased storminess and sea level rise in the northeast, the northeast coast, particularly around New York. Um, she, uh, she is a graduate of Yale University and also uh, 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 did work at the uh, School of Forestry and Environmental uh, Resources, uh, which is now known as the School of the Environment. Uh, and she has a master's degree in ecological landscape design from the Conway School and a master's in plant uh, and soil science from UMass. Um, sitting next to Wendy is Alice LeBanc, who is an economist and independent consultant who's worked for the past 20 years to promote market mechanisms as tools to address climate change and sustainable development. Her, tool, tool, her clients have included uh, uh, the Urban Land Institute, other NGOs, EPA, uh, the Government of Australia, the World Bank, United Nations, Commission for Environmental Cooperation, and a number of private sector clients. Um, uh, she actually headed the Office of Environment and Climate Change at the American International Group, AIG, um, and uh, she's also worked as a bank economist. Uh, uh, she has a BA in mathematics from Smith and an MS in economics from the University of Houston. Um, she's, a, she's a member of the Society of Women Geographers, uh, which the field of geography is, is central in addressing climate change, uh, I found <laughs> when I was, when, during my tenure at Penn State. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn the, uh, the, the uh, podium over to Alice. Okay, well, thank you, Bobby, and it's great to be here and to see so many people in the room. Um, I'm going to just give an overview about climate change, the climate change issue in general, some of the impacts, and uh, some uh, discussion of the insurance industry's role in tackling the problem. So to start, to quote Yogi Berra, <laughs> the future ain't what it used to be. And these four slides um, illustrate that point, I hope. The, one, the first one is uh, a satellite image of Superstorm Sandy. Uh, or maybe it's a photograph, I'm not sure. But you can see how big this storm is. It's over 1,000 miles across. And it's um, similar, in some ways, to the hurricane that hit the New York City area uh, just a year before Sandy, Irene. Both of them were bigger and went farther inland than um, hurricanes in the area have in the past. So um, that's one of the things about climate change. As the sea surface gets warmer, and we expect it to keep getting warmer, uh, the storms are expected to be more intense. And hurricanes are a little different, but some storms are expected to become more frequent quickly uh, as well. So the uh, other pictures are just pointing out visually some of the property on our coast that are very vulnerable to hurricanes. Uh, Miami, Boston, and this is the Mid-Atlantic region. And to quantify that a little bit, this is some insurance industry data on the value of insured, U.S. insured coastal properties vulnerable to hurricanes in 2012. So not everything is covered here. It's just the insured coastal properties. And it's also an underestimation um, of what we can expect in the future as more people move to the coast, which they are doing, and so there's more economic activity in more in harm's way on our coast. But for the 18 states in 2002, the um, value of the co insured coastal properties vulnerable to hurricanes was about 10 trillion. Um, and also, because uh, you know that number would be expected to increase for the reasons I just mentioned. The, um, okay, this is another um, chart illustrating a trend in the a number of natural catastrophes worldwide. This comes from the insurance reinsurer Munich Re, and one of the things that's interesting. This is from 1980 to 2013, the, just the first six months of 2013. Uh, there is a clear trend 
going up in the number of events, natural catastrophes of a certain size. But one thing that's interesting to me is that uh, the events in red are geophysical events, earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, volcanic eruptions, which are not uh, really susceptible to climate change. They're not caused by climate change. And that group is pretty constant <laughs> over the time period, whereas the other categories, which are all weather-related, are really what's driving the, the increasing trend. So that includes storms and floods and extreme temperatures, droughts, forest fires, which aren't really so much the topic today, but which are also increasing both in terms of frequency and severity. And this shows the um, overall and insured losses from uh, these larger natural catastrophes worldwide from 1980 to 2013. Again, the data comes from Munich Re, and they've even drawn in the trend lines um, showing that there are upward trends in losses. And while some of these upward trends uh, come from the fact that there is more property, more value in harm's way, they have clearly identified that there's an imprint of climate change in these trends. So these are just some very basic concepts. I don't know, you know what everyone knows about the topic, but um, there are two, two sides to this. There's uh, greenhouse gas emissions mitigation. It's pretty well established that the cause of climate change is the emissions that we as human beings are causing, the increase in those emissions from fossil fuel, tropical deforestation, and agriculture. Those are the three you know, main categories. In this country, it's more the fossil fuel use, but in develop the developing world, it comes more from land use, from agriculture and uh, deforestation. So uh, that's one part of the problem. That's the cause. And that's mainly about emissions and carbon. The other side that we're now, you know, when I first started working in this area, the whole focus was on mitigation because the symptoms hadn't become quite as evident. But now the focus has really changed or ch is changing to adaptation. What do we do to reduce the risk of those impacts that we know are going to occur, whether or not we reduce emissions? But at the same time, we have to work on reducing emissions or the impacts are just going to get worse and worse, and we'll never keep up with that. And so a lot of these adaptation or resilience measures have to do with water, with flooding, with hurricanes, with heavy precipitation. Um, so this kind of sums it up. This was uh, comments made by Fred Krupp, who's president of the Environmental Defense Fund, at a conference that the Urban Land Institute held uh, earlier this year on risk and resilience in coastal regions. And Fred, I think, sums it up very well. He says, how do we manage the unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable? So managing the unavoidable is related to reducing emissions, to trying to slow that emission, stop the emissions before, um, no, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. Managing the unavoidable is what we do to uh, become more resilient to what we know is going to happen based on what's already gone up into the air, the emissions we've already emitted. Avoiding the unmanageable is reducing emissions so that we don't have a situation where the impacts become unmanageable. So we have to, we have to do both of those things. Uh, so this is another, um, some more numbers from Guy Carpenter, which is the reinsurance uh, subsidiary of Marsh, the global insurance broker. And the, this shows the, uh, an index measuring land and ocean temperatures from 1880 to 2010, with the zero point being um, from 1951 to 1980. So this area, uh, you know, in the middle there where it's kind of around zero. And so I, this is, you know, just a kind of dramatic graphic representation of how uh, the planet is heating up. Oh, that, and then this one is the, another similar on the heat content of the first 700-meter um, layer of the ocean. 
and so these are just plotted from 1955 to 2010. Uh, again, a clear trend that the um, ocean temperature is rising. So what are some of the impacts that we're already seeing? Well, these are some selected pictures. Uh, the monarch butterfly last year, it's the most, once the most common butterfly in North America, was down to 7% of its historic level. And part of that was due to the fact that some of its feeding grounds, you know, it migrates between Mexico and uh, the United States. But its feeding grounds were being converted to agriculture. So some of the milkweed that it feeds on wasn't there. But another big part of it was that the, in the breeding grounds in Mexico, it was so much warmer that um, the eggs were being killed by the heat. So 7% of what it normally is. Uh, the next picture shows the melting permafrost up around the Arctic Circle in Alaska and uh, a house just collapsing. Now, under that melting permafrost is methane, lots of it, and that methane, as the permafrost melts, will start to come up. And that's one of the most potent greenhouse gases. So this is what's called a feedback mechanism. But the next is the molecule of methane, which is CH4. It's an interesting molecule because methane itself is a fossil fuel that's one of the cleanest and um, emits less green, mo most efficient in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And it, when it's burned as a fuel, it turns into carbon dioxide, which is also a greenhouse gas, but a less potent one than methane. But the molecules of methane that are coming up from the permafrost will add tremendously, if, if they continue to increase, to the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. This picture is of the devastation caused by the pine beetle in the western United States and Canada. Um, I think last year or the year before. The pine beetle has always been around and periodically appears and kills a lot of trees. But uh, a couple of years ago, or last year, I'm not sure, because it was hotter, it had another breeding cycle, and it um, devastated 7,000 square miles of forest in the Rockies, U.S. and Canadian Rockies, um, which is millions of acres and billions of trees. Uh, this shows the melting snows of Kilimanjaro. The mountain glaciers are retreating all over the world. Uh, since 1912, about five-sixths of the ice has been lost. You can see 1912 and 2002. And it's expected that in 20 years or less, the ice is going to be totally gone from Mount Kilimanjaro. And finally, we have the picture of Irene that I mentioned before, the hurricane the year before Sandy, that went, that's in Vermont, which is way, way inland from where the flooding of a hurricane would normally occur. And, you know, finally, uh, the Arctic ice is melting. Uh, most of this ice is um, floating ice, so it, it doesn't contribute so much to the sea level rise, uh, but also some of the ice on the West Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets, which is not floating, is beginning to melt. And as that melts, um, that's like putting an ice cube in the glass of water. The sea level rise will go up more dramatically. And you can check out on um, NOAA's website or on YouTube, there's something called the Arctic Report Card, which uh, gives a nice little video of what's happening in the Arctic. So um, these are projections from the National Climate Assessment. This is a US government report, about 12 agencies, including EPA, NOAA, Department of Defense, Defense Department of Interior. From 1985 to 2013, the US land temperature increased 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit, and the average global sea level rise was 0.8 inches. So their forecast are, and the, large, the, the forecasts are uncertain for um, several reasons. The biggest one is what is the path of future emissions going to be? Uh, if it's lower, then there'll be less severe. If it's higher, the forecast will be higher. 
So they're estimating by the middle of this century, two to four degrees Fahrenheit increase. That's an addition to the 1.5. And by the end of uh, the century, three to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, if you think about what's happened with one and a half degrees, <laughs> I mean, 10 is kind of off the charts, but um, even if it's at the lower end, it should be a pretty uh, dramatic increase in the impacts. The same for global sea level rise, eight inches in this historic time period, and uh, expected one to four feet by uh, the end of the century, with a, a possibility of six feet by the end of the century. And a lot of the uncertainty has to do with um, the dynamics of ice melt, as well as the emission projections, because there are a lot of uncertainties around that. How much time? OK, so I got to, I'm going to speed up here and uh, just go into, um, I'll skip this one. This is just similar forecast for the New York City area. Um, this is a quote from a risk manager in our uh, Urban Land Institute conference. Uh, where he says, we're getting hit harder and harder each year, regardless of what you think about climate change. The top controversy in the insurance industry is how to address the increasing frequency of catastrophic weather events. So just a clear indication that the insurance industry is w really waking up to, to this, because we're starting to see the impacts. This is another uh, very good report by Guy Carpenter, in which they say that um, a great deal of noise has clouded the need for objective decisions about very real atmospheric perils. And um, the great, single greatest threat under global warming is that of sea level rise. I think that's germane to the topics we're looking at today. Um, but again, a um, pretty strong statement that this is a problem. Um, finally, this came from the national underwriter which is a fairly mainstream conservative insurance industry publication, uh, it, talking about the, the critically important role that the insurance industry has to play in trying to find uh, solutions. So this gets to resilience, um, which is about uh, often described as bouncing back. If you have a storm, how quickly can you recover? Can you bounce back? But we like to say it's bouncing forward because we're looking at a different future from the historical uh, risk. Uh, so resilience is highly co correlated with risk mitigation and adaptation. Um, it saves money and enhances property values. Studies have shown this over and over again. The rule of thumb is $1 spent in risk mitigation gives back $4 in savings when a storm hits. Um, and the last two are really key because risk-based pricing is the core of uh, how insurance works. If your risk are higher, your premiums are higher. And so this provides incentives for risk mitigation because if you reduce your risk, then uh, you can, your insurance will go down. So regional risk solutions, Wendy is going to talk about this more, but that's the concept in, in terms of... Um, hurricanes and storms, ocean storms, of, um, oh, I got the one, of uh, a barrier, a big regional barrier system that would really protect the region, lower the risk profile for everyone in the region. But there's still localized resilient solutions, such as building codes and um, zoning and uh, building specific barriers that can that should go hand in hand with the regional solution. So uh, I'm just going to flip to the end. Um, uh, it's clearly being resilient or re reducing risk uh, supports a stronger economy. Um, I mean, that's kind of self-evident. <laughs> and um, finally, uh, this concept of new mechanisms for financing some of the risk mitigation measures that we need to do, as opposed to just taking money from the federal government. Uh, so it's, the idea is the government and private sector working together to provide a good or service with a public component. And um, that's something that we need to consider, especially given the 
economics today and the, the difficulty in getting funding uh, of how to be creative about this. And finally, um, some of the possible ways that these public-private partnerships might work. Um, you know, the sources of capital are pretty much standard. Um, keep pressing. Uh, the government, for example, would conduct a feasibility study. Uh, debt would be issued. Um, I mean, uh, there'd be a tax-free bond issued for debt. And uh, public pension funds or insurance companies or other investors would come up with the equity. That's sort of standard. But the sources of payback is where uh, you can be more creative. Uh, because when you think about it, the federal government, as well as the states and cities, uh, really have uh, an interest in paying for the uses of this protective service because it's going to save them money in the long run. And uh, finally, there could be user revenues coming in in the terms of fees, for port fees, and um, you could possibly integrate renewable energy into the structure and get some revenues that way. And finally, and probably the most controversial maybe or difficult, but is to actually get property owners to pay a fee that would then translate into reduced risk and lower insurance premiums for them and allow the insurance industry to come back in, for example, to the flood insurance market because they're able to offer, quote, unquote, affordable insurance. So I hope I uh, thank, thank that Thank you, Alice. <laughs> Wendy will now address how green infrastructure can be implemented in, in these. Uh, yeah, resilience. I'll try to give some, some visuals for it. And, and a big focus on this is highlighting the need to really consider the future conditions. Um, I like to say our company has a front row seat on climate change. This is actually a little uh, lunch deck we have. There's a table and chairs out front. And this is what it looks like when the moon is full and the tide is high and the wind blows the storm surge up into our little creek. And th normally this is where we park our cars, but as you can see, it's a lovely waterfront setting on this particular day. That happens about eight times a year. Fortunately, it's as predictable as the tide, so we can live around it. And it keeps the idea top of mind for our whole science and engineering and design team. We're very familiar with the data and, um, you know, the, the um, there's something going on here with timings. I don't know if it's even, um, well. It's very sensitive, I think. No, I think it's got timings in it, so it's going oh. forward automatically. Um, so th the future is already here. If you look at rainfall intensity over the past, uh, you know, since 1920s, the peak 24, you know, the, the peak amount of rain that falls in a 24-hour period used to be down like that. Now it's actually almost double. So that means when people were very careful and precise about designing stormwater pipes, the numbers they were using don't count today. The storms overwhelm them. And this is being experienced in a lot of areas just due to rainfall precipitation. And climate science helps us understand why and also that it's going to continue to worsen um, because the, rain, the, the, the air holds more moisture and dumps it all in one place over a condensed period of time. So a lot of these things are not speculative about the future. We have the evidence that there are very substantial changes that really should be influencing how we plan, how we design, and how we quantify engineering. There's one little dirty secret, though. Most people really aren't using this information and updating their procedures. We have a sort of custom of just keeping with the standards that people have relied on in the past. So in addition to all of the flooding, uh, which is usually mapped pretty effectively, there's another issue, which is that sometimes um, the things you've mapped, the landforms and the terrain that you may have mapped, um, it leaves. You know, it gets eroded out from under you. Um, this happened, of course, when Sandy struck the northeast, as the lower left image shows at uh, Mantle Locking. And these, pic these other pictures at the top are from uh, Hurricane Irene when it impacted Vermont. So. It's really important that when people show flood maps and even the whole premise of FEMA's mapping over the years has really been to show where this kind of still, imagine rising the water in the bathtub and it, it reaches a certain elevation. But when a storm really hits, 
it's not like that. <laughs> you know, there's um, boats being slammed into houses and the river changing its alignment entirely and taking out the, the entire roadway, not putting water up to this mark on the road surface. So this is another thing that isn't always captured, and the idea that the landforms themselves really change and that there's a cumulative uh, and multiplicative impact. So, um, you know, is this actually the way we should engineer major public investments, looking in the rearview mirror and failing to keep our eye on the horizon line and understand what's coming? Because um, it's upon us already. So I would offer the priorities involve really improving resilience um, and generally address it. When you do this, you will, all the other sustainability parameters tend to follow. Um, you're going to achieve life cycle value, which has all the economics behind it. You need to engage the public in really understanding the risk and helping to visualize when problems hit, what will it be like. Sandy was a huge wake-up call, as was Irene, but there still isn't really a good, broad understanding among the public or even among the folks who often lead design decisions that come both from a combination of investment and regulation and engineering. <laughs> So it's important to put new strategies uh, informed by new technologies into action, and all of it needs to be guided by future conditions, not just replicating or somewhat, somewhat expanding upon the past. And it's important for it to be able to happen fast enough <laughs> to gain political support. That's one problem with our society. If things can't happen in a meaningful level inside of an election cycle, most people just don't have the willpower to carry it forward at all. Um, so this project, I'm going to wait for it to scroll forward and I'll scroll it back. <laughs> um, this is a major DPW, Department of Public Works facility in the town of Lexington, Massachusetts. It's a pretty unremarkable site, very utilitarian, happens to be a sort of used and abused brownfield. Um, lots of very workaday structures, salt storage, truck cleaning, things like that, lots of parking. And in order to address the uh, replacement and upgrading with a LEED certified building at this Department of Public Works facility, the goal was, of course, first and foremost, to comply with the environmental regulations, but to do so by actually capturing and treating runoff at its source. Um, using the site and all the measures that were put there, the best practices, to use it as a way to promote understanding of those best practices throughout the community among town um, engineering personnel and public, the public coming to different town meetings and so on. And um, to not just address the stormwater in a strictly compliant way, but to make entirely functional landscape something that could um, uh, engage in, engage people and be visible. I loved how Jim was talking in, in the introduction about how important this stuff is visible. It's not buried, so you can actually celebrate it and get more people interested. Um, we actually, this is the first project to be a Department of Public Works type facility and gain uh, LEED certification. It actually exceeded LEED silver standards. And it did so using this really well integrated natural systems approach. And there was an interesting twist. Um, with a little prodding from, from our uh, policy folks at Bioengineering Group, the town of Lexington had adopted a brand new stormwater standard, something a little more far-reaching than most standards, where the new standard was to not just to not break the watershed much more with every new development or redevelopment, but to actually, every time there was a significant redevelopment or new development project, to actually mimic pre-colonial runoff rates in that project. Because they, they'd been having lots of little ranch houses converted to McMansions, and the downtown area was flooding with the tiniest rainfall event. Not counting, you know, well, of course, it's a cumulative effect of climate change and watershed development impacts. So the idea was to set the benchmark to the highest level of watershed function and, and natural system stormwater handling that the, that the watershed ever did on its best day before Columbus set foot on the continent. The only thing was, this was the first project coming out under the new rules. The town was like, ah, we painted ourselves into a corner. We said, relax, I think we can get you out of this. So the toolbox that was used included green roofs, harvesting and beneficial use of, of roof runoff, all kinds of structural infiltration measures, but most of all, the bioretention basins and swales, porous, leaky asphalt, um, and a whole bunch of other related measures to make the whole thing work in a treatment train with most, the most benefit. 
So the vegetated roof was not on the entire building or on all the buildings, just actually the most visible part. I notice you get some wonderful views from, from the windows here of some local green roofs. You're very lucky. Um, the green roof isn't really green. This time of year it turns lovely fall colors and includes basically a bunch of low maintenance um, alpine plants and best of all, even some habitat. We had birds nesting on the green roof the first year. Um, there are a bunch of structural chambers. Again, this involves excavating, proper subgrade, preparing uh, you know, these little underground support structures that serve to hold water, and uh, also using a whole <coughs> host of vegetated depressed areas to manage uh, water volume and provide water quality. The porous asphalt requires some careful subgrade preparation. And the photo in the bottom left shows on a rainy day, the water is pooling on the standard driving lane asphalt surface. And then it runs off the road crown until it hits the porous asphalt, literally dribbles right through the pore spaces there. And you can pour a bucket of water right in it, it just vanishes right through. So also some constructed wetlands all around the site. And when you add it all up, there's a really a tremendous portion of the footprint that is used to manage stormwater by minimizing runoff or capturing and repurposing water. Um, and in fact, it's, it's all over the place. And it is visible. And it doesn't displace or prevent using the site for something else. But best of all, if you add up everything that's there, all of that uh, little bit of green infrastructure scattered around the site provides 100% storage as well as water quality treatment for the peak 24-hour um, rainfall event up to the 100-year storm. So not just the annual storm, not just the water quality flush. We did it to handle everything up to the 100-year storm. And we've done that for many projects, which means this isn't just stormwater compliant. This doesn't just get you out of the 404 water quality certification. This is also a flood mitigation solution. Um, a little bit about maintenance cost. Um, the, the point here is that green infrastructure costs less than its gray infrastructure counterparts. But there's places for each. You saw we use some non-green stuff in our, in our recipe as well. Now, um, for a mega project for coastal infrastructure, um, how many people here know that there was an infrastructure solution that was designed from scratch and executed after Katrina hit Greater New Orleans. So was, Congress appropriated $14 billion. And in a way that people who know a lot, I'm, I'm impressed that people here know about this. Because in most places, people say, that's impossible. There's no way. They must have had those plans on the shelf first. Or they must have had everything permitted, and the, the missing link was finally getting the funding. The really amazing and perhaps motivating point is that um, People went from zero to 60, and they got $14 billion from Congress. And through a very effective, creative, uh, multi-party planning process, figured out what to do, where to do it, how to optimize the system, how to factor in future sea level rise, locally very extreme land subsidence rates, and get all the buy-in necessary to get NEPA clearance in six months and carry out the execution so that it functioned less than four years from when the first little what if it looked like this diagram was sketched. And when Hurricane Isaac approached on almost the same track as Katrina with about 90% of the intensity of Katrina, this time last year, September 2012, the whole system, which cost $14 billion, is estimated to have saved $30 billion in, in loss of insured losses, which doesn't even count the public infrastructure that it, that it shielded. So that system itself, which is known by a, an atrocious acronym of the Hurricane Storm Damage Risk Reduction System, HISDRS, um, it, I didn't come up with it. <laughs> um, it, um, it actually consists of a whole lot of hard gray infrastructures, the largest open water barrier in the world and the largest pump station in the world, et cetera, et cetera. But also integral to that system is vast expanses of um, of constructed wetlands, restored and reinforced barrier islands, and other green infrastructure at the regional scale. Now, for that project, there were a whole host of risk and uncertainty factors. And most of the time, um, the engineering community doesn't want to talk about the things you don't know or the things you can't quite pin down or the fact that making a, a certain assumption 
may not cover all the bases. And if you had to make assumptions large enough to cover all the imaginable bases, the cost would be hundreds of billions of dollars. So the challenge was to address risk and uncertainty with transparency and rigor um, and to proceed even in light of recognizing some, some things that were remaining as uncertain. So these included sea level rise, land subsidence, increased rainfall intensity, um, increased storm surge height due to wind and air pressure, and um, also the, the way that the storm can interact with the built environment, creating these hybrid failures. One of the reasons the flooding was so extreme in New Orleans was because when it didn't creep up on anybody and it didn't spread out over a large area. When, once that storm surge went through a couple of breached levees, it just filled a couple of small footprint areas as you know, with all that water volume. So we call that a hybrid failure, where sometimes the infrastructure can help bring on some uh, worsened extremes. And overall, in that delta, the natural land forming processes had really been interrupted. So everything that usually happens in a delta to grow land had turned into over 30 square miles a year of land loss. So all of the naturally buffering wetlands that would shield the greater New Orleans region are, are being lost at a terrific rate, rate every year. Most troubling was the fact that all of the past data about this rapidly changing landform and these rapidly escalating future stress factors, it necessitated a, a whole new model for statistical analysis and decision frameworks. You couldn't just look something up in the past or see what happened over the last 50 years and use that to guide the process. And this, was a, this required a huge amount of communication to the public so they would understand why something entirely new was needed. And it literally required writing a new federal decision process for um, incorporating those future-based criteria into the development of the engineering design, which in, in essence consisted of building this barrier there <laughs> in this funnel-shaped embayment that allowed the um, storm surge to become so huge. And you saw that little funnel taken away by the correct positioning of, in particular, this uh, open water surge barrier. That was part one of many mul of the multiple lines of defense, many of which were green infrastructure elements. But in this case, especially for storm surge mitigation, you need the structure. You can't do it alone uh, with the green. But the structure without the green wouldn't work. So here's all these different images. I don't know. This is it's just steering itself. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're we're flipping through a couple of things there. Okay. So a whole bunch of green infrastructure, some of which has reinforcement, dunes, some of which do, some of which don't have reinforcement, and uh, things like the closing gates that allow navigation and ecologically healthy water circulation, but which can be closed down, blocking the storm surge when it happens. Interestingly, a lot of these were done in a way that really helped promote um, improved navigation, and it was better for commerce. And this was something, once we worked with local um, shipping interests uh, to fiddle around with how the design could work, they were hugely on board. Lots of levees, lots of walls, lots of other structures were part of this. We even found a way to in integrate wind turbines into the footings for the walls. So, um, and I'll just show back here. It's a, it actually, you can see off there in the distance, the monopoles and the wind turbines on top getting double duty from the structures in order to pay for the maintenance and ultimately replacement cost of some of these structural measures, be they green or gray or both. So, um, in New Orleans, there were certain issues, but there's a lot that's generalized. I mean, New Orleans definitely is something of a canary in a coal mine, not just for this country, but for the world. But a lot of the things that worked well to allow that whole process to get done so quickly and with many creative elements can be replicated elsewhere. And, and the fact that such a huge process was pulled off in a very quick period of time with very little controversy, very little media attention, frankly, um, warrants a little bit more scrutiny so people can explore the different ways that it might help in other regions, because I think there are many ways that it can. Um, this hopefully will tie in with some points that Alice made. You know, um, green infrastructure does a couple things to interface with the broad climate issues. You know, every time you're using green infrastructure instead of the gray stuff alone, 
you're actually making water vanish. You're using every little spot in the landscape to store, process, and allow water to leave, mostly through evapotranspiration. But you're also, in that same process, growing plants, adding organic matter to soil. And ultimately, at the national scale, we have the opportunity to you know, pull gigatons a year of carbon out of the atmosphere instead of most stormwater infrastructures, which are very uh, emission-oriented. So green infrastructure both helps solve the flooding issue and also has a more than nominal um, impact on the carbon budgets of the atmosphere. And it can really be used not just at the scale that we've known green infrastructure in the past, which is a little rain garden here and a little bioswale there, but it can be added up in very meaningful ways at the site scale, at the infrastructure corridor scale, or for regional level coastal infrastructure solutions. So I'd like to um, quote my favorite guy, Yoda, and say, um, it's not about trying, it's not about thinking about it, it's not about having a policy, you know. Do or do not, there is no try. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, briefly take us uh, through some um, suggested mechanisms to deal with, uh, with uh, finance. Uh, uh, green infrastructure is obviously is going to make um, uh, us more resilient um, and it reduces cost, as, as, as we've seen. But we are still talking about billions, if not trillions, of dollars to, um, to gird the coast and to deal with the increased stormwater flooding and, um, and uh, sea level rise that we need to, to deal. So it is going to require some innovative um, financing mechanisms. Uh, Obviously, traditional municipal bond finance will be will be one of them. But um, the other mechanism is to try to leverage some uh, public-private uh, financing to uh, develop projects that will both integrate green infrastructure and other um, uh, potentially uh, 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 useful um, and money-making projects that can support project finance. And one of the things I'd like, and that is also going to require some basic seed money. Um, it's going to require uh, fees, since you can't talk about taxes in, in our current, current environment, um, and fees really to begin leveraging. And one of the things that, that is emerging, and actually emerging right now in, 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 in rulemaking, is the ability to leverage climate mitigation, putting a cost on carbon, um, with methods to adapt. And I'll just go through, um, I think we've already heard that uh, there are problems, uh, the, the, the problems of sea level rise. I just had this um, slide from 2000 um, showing, uh, showing the uh, areas with very high flooding uh, uh, risk that was predicted to occur sometime around 2050 at this time. And obviously, these are the areas where we're seeing it much earlier in, in, in Sandy. Uh, this is probably a somewhat more realistic assessment by Jim Hansen showing the areas that would be underwater with a uh, six meter rise, which is, which is in fact feasible and sort of a worst case. And you know, like one, one, of, the, one of the examples I like to give is, um, is, is right there in the Ganges Delta where 70 million people will be displaced. So, um, and obviously, we see a huge problem in, uh, the, in, in, in the United States on the East Coast. Um, now, one of the things that, that, that we can do to try to start anticipating this and building the type of barriers in green infrastructure is to really um, is to try to leverage some of the measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there are revenues, for instance, from the sale of emissions credits um, can be devoted to this. But similarly, as, as, as Wendy pointed out, uh, wet, the constructed wetlands can, can uh, sequester quite a bit of carbon and actually reduce or at least mitigate, keep the, keep the, uh, the, the, the emissions uh, and levels of carbon dioxide uh, where they can't, um, where they uh, uh, will not cause catastrophic damages, although one might say something like Sandy is catastrophic, but it could obviously be far, far worse. So 
Um, prevention, obviously, as I mentioned, is going to be expensive, but not preparing is even going to be more expensive. And in fact, right now, we are paying the cost through increased taxes, through insurance premiums, and even lack of insurance. One of the things that, 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 that Wendy and Alice didn't mention is right now many areas in the coast, companies are simply not writing new insurance for that. And as we're talking about areas with trillions of dollars of infrastructure, it's, it's probably critical that we figure out a way to protect it and, and to provide insurance. So where, where are some of the funding opportunities to, to provide the seed money? One is funds from putting a cost, a, a cost on carbon emissions, which is currently being done now. One is imposing insurance charges, um, uh, imposing insurance charges on everyone to, 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 to build the risk to reduce insurance. A third one is, is dedicated taxes, putting a, put it, putting a tax on the areas where they aren't writing insurance in order to make that insurance available by, by, by girding the coast. And finally, trying to reduce the cost of, 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 of building this infrastructure by leveraging through private, uh, public-private partnerships. Um, the, actually, the President's climate plan specifically puts a priority on, on both these adaptation measures and mitigation measures. And one of, the, um, uh, one of the opportunities that we're seeing developed right now is developing greenhouse gas emission standards for utility units under what Section 111 of the, of the Clean Air Act. Um, uh, Section 111D is somewhat unusual in that the EPA will establish guidelines and then the states implement that. And currently we have um, uh, EPA will establish uh, standards for the states and, and, and will also establish standards for approving state plans, known as state implementation plans. And if a state fails to implement its um, uh, a, a program meeting the EPA standards, EPA will impose those standards on the state. So this is a question, this is in the Clean Air Act, it provides a mechanism to um, to significantly reduce greenhouse gas, uh, gas emissions from uh, the, the sector that's responsible for about 40 percent of the na nationwide uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and it provides an opportunity, depending on how the state um, manages it, to generate funds for this. Um, uh, most notably, EPA will establish something that meets, that will, for which existing state programs will satisfy the requirements, providing they, they, they generate enough emissions reduction. And both California and the nine Reggie states, um, uh, that's New England, uh, used to be New Jersey, but no longer, Maryland, Delaware, um, and New York, um, uh, have adopted a cap and trade program where all of the allowances are auctioned and the auction revenues are then devoted to a variety of purposes, including energy efficiency, but also climate adaptation. To the extent that other states join in this, those revenues will increase and there will be additional revenues. And if a similar mechanism is used by the states, this could generate a, a fund for developing some of these projects and mitigating the impact of the emissions themselves. Um, uh, and this presents an opportunity, perhaps with other mechanisms such as such as such as dedicated fees, for leveraging with um, with public-private partnerships. Um, uh, green green infrastructure, of course, would be important for reducing the cost of these programs. But some of the examples: wetland islands can become a part of a barrier with gates, um, you know, both reducing carbon and and providing support. R wetland islands could support for-profit mechanisms. For instance, a bypass around uh, a for, for, for a, uh, a toll road getting around New York, which could, which could be put on some of those islands and, and, and provide financing. It's obviously something that anybody who's gone through New York uh, knows is necessary at some point. Um, providing, um, providing a, ba a basis as as Wendy mentioned, for windmill and energy projects. Um, similarly, girding resilience will require um, mechanisms such as, such as smart grids. So I think there are opportunities here, and right now we're in the process of formulating 
uh, the policy. So we have to think of economics and we have to think of a mechanism to deal, deal with this uh, cost effectively and uh, engaging the, the private sector. So with that, I'll, we'll open it up for a, a few minutes of questions. Well, I guess there are no questions, so we can uh, we can move on. Oh yes, um, Bobby, how many dollars has Reggie in California put into energy efficiency and infrastructure type projects, and what's the scale that we're talking about? Well, right now, um, the, the California is just in its first year right now. Um, Reggie. The states devote their, their, their monies either to um, either to energy efficiency, alternative energy, or in some cases, consumer rate relief. On, on um, their Reggie right now operates with a has been operating with a dollar ninety three floor, and had a budget that was too high, one hundred and seven million. Starting next year, they are reducing the budget and moving the floor up, and will actually the the, the market has improved, but. Roughly, they, they've been, um, they, they had a 170 million ton uh, budget. They've probably been selling about 100. Right now, they're probably actually at 91 million dollars tons. So, it, at a buck 93 with um, with 100 million tons, let's say 193 million dollars are produced per year uh, with those sales. Now, the price is going to go up with a federal system that prevents leakage because right now, for instance, coal, a lot of coal plants in Pennsylvania are exporting their electricity into Reggie because they're competing really unfairly, um, uh, those revenues will go up. Um, if Pennsylvania were to adopt it, it would have significantly higher revenues. If, 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 if Ohio adopted it, even higher revenues. Illinois probably is seriously considering it. So. Uh, California is in its first year in the first phase of its of, of, of its of its emissions, but California has a floor of ten dollars a ton on its emissions. Yes. Uh, could you and the other panelists maybe talk a little bit about balancing um, investments in uh, infrastructure versus balancing investments in abandonment of uh, existing properties and solvents? Well. Um, sometimes the aban abandonment happens by choice, kind of a managed retreat. Sometimes it just hits you, like Katrina and Sandy. I think what, you, what we see happening, even if it's happening at times on a painfully slow pace, um, once, once disaster strikes, the only thing that happens is people put it back the way that it was because that source of funding and that time frame of contemplation or lack thereof yields that result. So far, I've never seen anything really meaningfully different. Um, ultimately, retreat is going to be important. If we looked realistically at the asset vulnerability up and down the shorelines of the United States, river corridors and coast, low-lying coastal areas, um, the true value of assets at risk is, is staggering. And the idea of somehow walking away from them all would be a bit um, hard to swallow, at least all at once. So by, by looking at regional infrastructure, I would suggest it's a good way to buy something like a century of time to really plan how to replace those assets on a staggered basis in a smarter way, maybe somewhere else. Yeah. Um, I would. I would agree with that, uh, but also add that, um, you know, if, if you had something like a big regional infrastructure project around the tri-state area, um, maybe it would protect uh, fairly successfully for 40 or 50 years. A lot of it depends on what we do, and I'm, I'm one that still has some hope <laughs> that we can uh, reduce our emissions or get some of them out of the atmosphere, get some of those molecules out of the atmosphere, and actually uh, not have to face a, a massive, massive retreat. But I think this all points out that there's a certain urgency to this issue and that we have to really work at both parts of it, adapting 
and also reducing the cause, getting the emissions out of the air. And so any solution, this has already been pointed out a couple of times, that can do both of those things um, is really the best solution. Well, thank you very much. And, and I'd like to...